It is a great, great pleasure to have Rich Miller with us this afternoon. Rich is a professor at the University of California, Berkeley, and at the Berkeley Lab. He has been there for many years, actually, um, since he was a graduate student working with Louis Alvarez, Nobel laureate Louis Alvarez. Rich started working in particle physics. Then he got interested in astrophysics. He uh, was one of the pioneers uh, in understanding the uh, anisotropy of the micro background. He worked with George Mood, and the other Nobel laureate, the one six year Nobel laureate in, in actually discovering the dipole in the micro background. Rich went on to um, actually start the uh, project which got this year's Nobel Prize, so the uh, supernova project, which pretty much uh, is at one point Rich's baby. Um, and uh, right about at the time when I was uh, entering that business, Rich was drifting away from it and entering a new phase in his amazingly wide scientific career, which is the study of you know geophysics and, and, and earth sciences. And um, I remember, you know, amazingly, I mean, as, as opposed to coming to Berkeley, it was fascinating to enter into Rich's office and, and get excited about things I didn't know nothing about, but he was showing this fantastic data about periodicities in, in, in extinction of species, etc., which I think is probably the way he got interested in, in climate changes, I think, but we'll hear more about that. So the subject, and as you said, before getting to the subject, uh, Rich has also written a number of, of books, he has, he has fantastic books about the popularization of physics, and also a novel, which I was just reminding Rich, I was one of the first ones to think read the draft of the Sins of Jesus, which I, a book I enjoyed enormously uh, at the time. Uh, and, but again, going to today's uh, topic, I think uh, Rich has been leading this effort, uh, Ber Berkeley Earth Surface Temperature Project, the best project, and uh, that's what he's going to tell us about today. Please. Thank you. Yeah, if you had asked me uh, three years ago what I would be doing now, I would not have ever imagined I would get involved in the whole contentious issue of climate change. Um, I, I did. I'll tell you a little bit about how I got into it. Um, but it's, it's been a challenge. Certainly the most politicized field I've ever gotten into. And our approach, we decided from the very beginning, was to have nothing at all to do with the politics. Our goal was to stick to the science. And it seemed odd to us that not too many groups did that. Uh, it was almost an opportunity for us. We felt that, my sense was that many scientists had looked at, looked at climate change, had concluded that it was real and it was dangerous, uh, and that the public would not understand it, and therefore they had to exaggerate it when expressing it to the public. And there's, there's an enormous amount of exaggeration and misinformation. Uh, the problem is that when people learn that they've been exaggerated to, they tend to go back to the other side. And, and that's not accurate. That's not a good thing either. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll explain how I got in. But take a look at the, some of the list of the people up there. Uh, Robert Rohde, uh, I'll, I'll draw attention to. Donald Groom was here at the Nobel ceremonies. He's part of Saul's team. You notice Saul Perlmutter's name is there. Arthur Rosenfeld, who is one of the great heroes, if not the hero of energy conservation, but prior to that, had, had been to Stockholm when Louis Alvarez won the Nobel Prize. He was a key member of that team. These are people who are superb at analyzing data. And the reason I asked Saul to be on the team was that I wanted people who could get into new data that was enormously complex, very large, very difficult, full of systematic errors, uh, and who could pull out of that something that in the end turns out to be true. Now, Saul was tested on this. He had been through that experience. He had proven himself. So at Art Rosenfeld, so at Donald Groom and, and, and the others. So uh, the idea here was I wanted the very best scientists, not climate experts, but people who could jump in uh, and, and know how not to fool themselves. That's the real essence of science. So, so Saul has made valuable contributions. I'm starting with my last slide. So you can see what results we got. I'll go along, uh, I'll, I'll back up. Uh, in just a moment and show you why we got into it, what it was we were worried about, how we got here. But these are the final results. They will be published soon. They've been submitted for publication. Uh, they're available on our website, which is down here, berkeleyearth.org. Uh, and this is a temperature record from 1800 
to basically 2009. We, we're just recently adding in the, the more recent data. I'll show you some of that in a moment. But this is, the, this is the history of climate. It's really very interesting. This rise here is what concerns everybody. That's global warming. This is only on land. This doesn't include any ocean data. Now, land is more sensitive to climate change in the oceans. The oceans have changed less than the land. This goes up by about 1 degree Celsius, 0.9 degrees Celsius. If you average in the oceans, it's about 0.6. But we haven't done an independent assessment of the oceans yet. But you can look at this pattern. One, you can see these huge fluctuations, they had never been observed before we did our work. And we were able to get them by using better statistical methods. The gray bars are 95% confidence limits. And that means these variations are real. In fact, I was challenged by a scientist, a geophysicist, who said, do you believe these variations? My answer was, yes, I do. Uh, and part of that is because of the, of the very careful work we did on statistical methods. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that in this. We have a very long paper available online at this website where you can read about that. We have to answer some questions about that. Uh, I did want to mention Robert Rohde. You see, uh, one thing that Ariel didn't mention is that I hired George Smoot to work on the cosmic microwave background radiation. So I was his supervisor for the first half of that project. And then when he decided he wanted to take it off on a satellite, I let him do that on its own. I didn't join him. That's what he got the Nobel Prize for. But the earthbound measurements, I actually hired him. Next person I hired that I'm really proud of is Saul Perlmutter. So who is going to be the next in that list? I predict Robert Rohde. So, so write down his name. He is, he is, he is, he is, a, he is a, tr a true wonder. Uh, and he's, uh, he, he has actually been our one full-time person working on this. And he's done stupendous things uh, in terms of analyzing the data. But these variations are real. What are they? I'll show you later on. Uh, this is a 10-year running average. So it shows a smooth rise. In a little while, I'll show you a one-year running average. And you'll see their variations on that, too, up and down. And yes, we understand those, too. Well, we, understand, we know where they come from. Uh, there are some mysteries about that. But, but this is the basic answer. And the remarkable thing is that this one degree rise is approximately the same as the prior groups have gotten. In fact, when we uh, here are the blue, green, and red show the prior groups. Now, when we first did this, it was only blue that agreed with us. And green was down here with the red. And so we called up the NASA group and said, show them this disagreement, talked with them, found out that their land average actually was an average of the Earth using only land data. And so when they redid it, it popped up to agree with ours. <laughs> now, Hadley, the, the, the group in the UK, may, there may be a similar thing going on, but we haven't tracked that down yet. But here it is. This is a, a good record. Our error uncertainties are considerably smaller than those of previous groups. We go back further in time. <clears throat> okay. oh, I'm to... So here are the questions I thought I would pose. They may be on some of your minds. What's wrong with the US? Why do we deny climate change? Why don't we do things? Why didn't we ratify Kyoto? What's going on here? Why are there so many people in the U.S., particularly Republicans, who, who don't seem to think that this science is real, when everybody else knows it is. Is this because people in the U.S., unlike here, are anti-science? They don't believe it. They're much more interested in, 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 in intelligent design and divine creation, and they don't take this stuff seriously. The answer is more complex than you probably imagine. And I hope in the next 10 minutes, I will answer your question, these questions. What's, what, what's going on in the US? What, what's, what's so crazy about it? So let's begin with that. First, let me show you a map that I created. Oh, by the way, uh, again, I'm not going into the details here, but I will in a moment show you that whereas the previous groups used 8,000, up to 8,000 different temperature stations around the world, we used 39,000. Actually, it's about to jump up to 42,000 stations. So we are using much more data, 1.6 billion temperature measurements, made possible these days by, by supercomputers, which, which we use. But I have, I have the uh, yearly data on my laptop right here. And I can 
do computations in a few minutes for the simple things, the longer things take the supercomputer. Let me show you a map of the United States that I made uh, recently on, on this laptop. Map of the United States. And for every, this, this shows the stations in the United States that have records uh, that have collected data for at least 100 years. And for each one of those, I, I just did a straight line. And then I marked whether the slope was positive or negative. So the zeros are the stations which, over the last 100 years, have cooled. And the red crosses are the ones that have warmed. This plot tells an awful lot about global warming. Really, you know, look at this and remember this plot. When I add them up, I find 33% of the stations are blue. 33% of the stations in the United States, and the same thing is true worldwide, have cooled over the last 100 years. 67% have warmed. When you average those together, you actually get one degree Celsius of global warming. The important, and how much do these places change? Typically several degrees Celsius, up and down. What this means is you cannot tell global warming by going outside. <laughs> and perhaps some of the reason that there are so many skeptics in the United States is that for so many of them, it's cooled over the last hundred years. They can look at their hometown records. Look online, you'll see this. You'll see people putting up. There's one post that said, I have 20 sites that have shown cooling. Global warming is nonsense. And my reaction is, 20 sites? I have 13,000 sites. 26,000 that are warming in the world, but 13,000 that are cooled. So last night, I <laughs> made a similar plot <laughs> for this region. And it's a little bit different. Many more pluses. There are the cooling spots. Uh, if you come across a European skeptic, you might ask where they come from. Uh, maybe they come from <laughs> these places. This is not, there's no, there's no climate. Well, in, in, the, in this plot, there's some climate going on. OK, clearly, the southeast United States has had a microclimate that's somewhat different from the rest of the United States. But, but here, the blue things are more or less random. And it's simply the fact that there are local variations that cause, these aren't measurement uncertainties. These are simply uncertainties in the, uh, in, 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 in local microclimate that are large enough that even if global warming is real, and the average I showed you in the first slide indicates it is, that still locally it may get cool just because of the microclimate. <laughs> okay, so this is one reason why I think there have been skeptics. Uh, and that is people, and you'll see this of the true believers too. I, I was recently at Congress, and one congressman said, global warming is so blatantly obvious, just walk outside. You know, no, no, you cannot, I cannot detect global warming on my own. As scientists, you can by averaging hundreds and thousands of sites. We'll talk about storms and other things like that in a moment. Where were these temperatures measured? In the United States, there are a thousand of the, what's called the historical uh, climate network, which are the best stations in the United States. A man named Anthony Watts, who I regard as a hero, he's an amateur scientist, uh, started surveying these things, and he, he got together a group of people to carefully document each one of these stations. And he found that many of the stations were on, on streets. Or, or next to heat sources. This is an infrared that shows it's, it's actually in a waste plant, and there's a heat source right next to it. Now, the US government posts a criterion for how good a station is. And it lists it's supposed to be so many meters away from the US heat source, so many meters from concrete, so many meters, and so on. So he started ranking these things. And what he found was that 70% of the stations in the United States were far below the standards used by the US government. And yet they were included in the temperature average. Now, if this is the case in the United States, what's it like in India? What's it like in Africa? What's it like around the world? This was such a serious issue that more than anything else, well, there are two events, two things. This is one of them. Made me think, do we really know what the temperature record is? 
Now, some people say, oh, it doesn't matter. There's so much other evidence of global warming. I want to show you in a moment that that's not true, not, not to a scientist. I mean, the public may think so because someone tells them. I was just discussing before the meeting that in the United States there was a, a survey taken outside of Chicago. And they stopped random people and they, they said, name a scientist you'd like your children to emulate. And you know who came in number one by far? You're all seated, right? Now you should sit down or you might faint otherwise. <laughs> Al Gore. <laughs> <laughs> number two was a tie between Albert Einstein and Bill Gates. <laughs> <laughs> With this terrible record, let me, let me show you the, the map watts put together. The red stations are the ones that have uncertainties of 2 to 5 degrees Celsius. Those are the uncertainties. And they could be systematic because they're near buildings. It could be warming, excess warming. And so what do you do with data like these? I, you know, I could ask you the following question. Two years ago, did you believe in global warming? Why? How could you when the temperature data are so bad? Anyway, it certainly bothered me. Uh, what we did in our study, I don't know if I'll get time to go into this in detail, so let me just tell you right now. We took the red stations and analyzed the temperature rise for those. We took the blue and green stations and did the temperature rise for those. Because of our good statistical methods, we could actually do fairly well. What we found to me was astonishing. There was no difference between them. These poorly sighted stations, it turned out, must have been poorly sighted over the last 30 years. Because you're hotter if you're next to a building but the rate of change doesn't seem to vary because of that. And that's an enormously important result. And when we got that result, which just recently, I, I testified before Congress on this thing, and, 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 and I got also the newspaper headlines because former skeptic now is a true believer. Well, not quite, but, but uh, this, was, you know, this is the sort of systematic error that Saul and Don and their team were fighting all the time in the supernova business. Until they solved that problem, they could not see the acceleration of the universe. And I claim, until this is addressed here, maybe you should not have believed in global warming. Well, you did, maybe, some of you. <laughs> and you were right. And that, a lot of people say, oh, this is no big deal. We knew all along the answer. Well, that's like people who said, oh, the universe was accelerating all along. We knew that. I just didn't have the evidence to show it. Uh, well, anyway, so that, that's, a, that's an important result. Here's another thing we did. The black are the number of stations used by the other groups. And you notice they had dropped way down. And there's a technical reason for that. It has to do with the formatting of the data. Uh, they never explained that. We had to track down why they weren't using them. Ours stayed way up. We used many, many more stations than anybody else. We used every station that we can. We used something like 97% of all available stations have adequate data that we can use them. People were worried that in using fewer stations, they were selecting the stations. Here are the, the color here didn't turn out too great. But the blue stations are the ones that have been used previously. And the red stations are the ones that we added in. And you can see we get much better world coverage. A Russian group of economists had complained that, uh, that, that the UK group had avoided using Siberia and that Siberia had showed pooling. And so there was a problem of whether they were selecting their data in a biased way. So we've done it both ways. We have used the same data that they used the same station, and then we use all the stations and look for a difference between the two. And to my delight, there was no difference. They were very, very close. What it indicates is that even though there was a data selection, that it was not done in a biased way that led to that answer. But I needed to know that answer before I could believe in one degree Celsius of global warming. Now, next is something I'm sure you've heard about, climate gate. Yes. <laughs> some people have. Climate gate. What was going on in climate gate? There were some uh, emails that were hacked. They were made public. Uh, there were people saying nasty things. It was, a, was, a, was a terrible thing. Well, look, most of us on the inside do not believe these were hacked. We believe they were leaked. They were leaked by a team member, and we think we know who it was, who was upset that his team was involved in a data cover-up. 
Let me show you that data coverage. Because not only were the emails released, and they weren't made the news, but what struck me was that the data were released. This is the plot that appeared on the cover of the annual review of climate change for the World Meteorological Organization. Oops, it's, the computer's doing that again. Stop it. Uh, and you can see this is proxy data. It's not really temperature data. Uh, it's, it's what's called proxy data, which means it's tree rings and things like that, in which they try to drive a temperature. And you can see it's getting cooler here, and here's a little ice age. And then it shoots up, and look at that, clear and incontrovertible. Well, it turned out that in their paper, they say that they made a change in the data right around here. And so several groups uh, uh, emailed them saying, please send us the data you eliminated. And they refused to do it. And finally, they got legally sent us that under the Freedom of Information Act. And they were, the Freedom of Information Act officer decided there was no need to do this. Now, he's under indictment now, and he may go to jail because of that. Uh, but the data that were really here, the data that were erased and replaced with temperature data, were released in that email leaking. We, we believe what was leaked, by the way, was the file that was put together by the Freedom of Information Act officer, which he decided not to release. Does it have the data? Let me show you what the data really were. Okay. Well, there's the data. Now, the team... <laughs> the team felt that this would be misleading to the public. Now you'll notice it's, there's no more variation there than there is over here. But this has happened in the last 60 years. We know the temperature's gone up in the last 60 years. We have really good data on that. So therefore this would be misleading. Therefore they concluded that these data are far, probably corrupt. That was the, they had no more justification than that. And so they erased it. And then what they did is they took the temperature data and they added it on at the end, which then goes up like that. And that's how they got the plot they published. Now, this is the sort of thing that politicians do all the time. But in my training, is never done by a scientist. You don't hide things. You show this. And then you explain your reason for erasing the data, and then you, then you show that. But they didn't. They only showed that. They had a sentence or two saying that they had made some changes, and they refused to release that. So that, this was a real scandal to me. This is a group in the UK. And at that point, I decided I can never once, I never again can I read any of their scientific papers, because you have to trust people when they're doing science. And if you lose that trust, if you think they may be trying to lead you to the conclusion they want by not showing all their data, I, I don't even want to read their papers anymore. Yes, they were exonerated. The, the, the committee that exonerated them never even looked at these data. They looked at their other papers. I, I don't know. This exoneration thing is something that I, I don't think is a high point for science. Uh, in my eyes, no. This is, this is scientific misconduct. Okay. What about all the other data? The number of hurricanes are increasing. Look at this. Here, in, 19, in 2005, we had so many hurricanes in the Atlantic that we ran out of names for them. Ran out of letters of the alphabet. Go back to 1933, and what you find is the same number of hurricanes over here as you have over here, maybe slightly more. This was a big hurricane season. But there were none out at sea. Why were there none out at sea? The reason is we didn't have satellites. We didn't have automated buoys. And, and the ships avoided this area, maybe because of all the hurricanes. I don't know. <laughs> so there's a selection bias. So there's a standard way to handle this in, in science. You, you pick an unbiased subsample. Let's just pick the hurricanes that hit the coast of the United States. We have really good records in the United States, back 150 years. And there, we haven't missed a single hurricane. A little bit hard to calibrate them, know how strong they were. But there are wind measurements. There are all sorts of things. They, they had anemometers. So let's take the ones that hit the United States, and if you do that, which I've done, you look them up online, and here they are, and the numbers have been going down slightly. What about the really severe ones in red? Well, that's been going down slightly, too. The number of hurricanes has not been going up. What about the number of wildfires, the number of tornadoes? I look those numbers up, too. Those are not increasing. We are detecting more. And when Al Gore, in his inconvenient truth, says the number of tornadoes is going up, what he means is that the number of 
tornadoes that we detect has been going up. But if you take an unbiased subsample, namely those hurricanes that actually touch down and do, and do damage, then the number has not gone up. It's actually been decreasing. Tornadoes are not going up. Wildfires in the United States, the numbers have been going down. A problem with an inconvenient truth is that it's a political document meant to inspire people in the United States to worry as much about global warming as Al Gore does. And it's not meant to be a scientific document. And he does what a lawyer does when presenting his case. He shows one side. And if there were space for another side, you'd discover that his, his data are cherry-picked. He's picked everything that's bad and attributed it to global warming. Things that are good, like the number of hurricanes actually going down, doesn't mention it. So be wary of learning your climate science from a politician. Uh, the fact is the US Hurricane Center in Miami has now changed its position. It no longer says the hurricanes were increasing. It understands this bias and now says they have indeed been going down. That doesn't make very much in the way of headlines. It doesn't mean global warming is wrong. I showed you my plot. Global warming is happening and it's, it worries me. Because that, that is very likely due to carbon dioxide increase. And carbon dioxide is going to shoot up. So we are in trouble, I think. But uh, this other evidence, uh, oh, this is the most, this is really, this, this illustrates another problem. <coughs> okay, Antarctica. This is a press release back a few years ago when, when the GRACE gravity measurement measured the ice change in Antarctica. And they concluded, to, uh, the Antarctic ice sheet is losing 38 cubic miles from the units. 38 cubic miles of ice. Here it is, 152 cubic kilometers annually. This made big headlines. Antarctica was melting. However, in the press release, these scientists drew attention to the fact that, oh, there it is. Let's go down to the bottom. The most recent intergovernmental panel on climate change, the IPCC, they, they were here a few years ago with Al Gore receiving the Nobel Prize. Not here. They got the Peace Prize. Uh, uh, completed in 2001. Predicted the Antarctic ice sheet would gain mass. And, and the IPCC asked the climate modelers to predict what will happen with global warming. And the answer was uh, Antarctic will grow. Why is that? Because Antarctic is still below freezing. And it was not going to be that much global warming. Uh, on the other hand, there'd be more evaporation from the oceans. And so there would be more precipitation. The ice mass should increase. So in fact, the discovery contradicted global warming. And after that, the modelers went back to try to explain how could this have happened. And they changed their model, they changed their climate model, and now they get the fact that, yes, uh, ice should decrease. They changed the model after the fact. Now they say this is, this is more proof of global warming. That, that's not science either. Not when you, not, it's not a prediction. Yes, you can account for it, but it shouldn't be listed as a prediction. Finally, oh, this is, uh, here's Stockholm. I thought you'd be interested. And, and I saw you plowed this up last night. So the, these are the yearly averages, and this is, and let's see, this is monthly, I guess. And these are the yearly averages. And you see, it really has been getting warm. There have been some warm times here. Not quite as warm as now, but you notice the temperature has really dropped recently. This is only 2009, and, and I don't have a, a more recent data. We'll see if, if it continues. Well, the IPCC report had all sorts of problems. Uh, the, the IPCC report it claims to be a referee document, but it's not really. The referees offer suggestions, and the authors can ignore them at their own will. Uh, the most embarrassing of which is the last IPCC report in 2007 said the Himalayan glaciers might melt in 25 years. They have subsequently backed down. This, it turns out, was based on a quote in a popular magazine of what a glaciologist had said. Except he denies that he ever said it. It's like, I, I recently wrote an op-ed piece for the Wall Street Journal, and they changed the title. And now I'm quoted as that title. Mueller said it. It's in the Wall Street Journal. I never said it. They changed the title on me. They reserved that right. They didn't ask you? They didn't ask me, no. They changed the title from, uh, my original title was Cooling the Debate Over Global Warming. And they changed it to The Case Against skepticism, which is not what the article is about, but they liked it better, I guess. Anyway, there have been lots of problems with the IPCC report. They're now running a new one. They have to clean up their act. The they say, oh, less than 1% of the report had these kind of mistakes in them. Yeah, it turns out to be the 1% that got all the newspaper headlines. 
And so everything you saw in the newspaper headlines, almost everything in the newspaper headlines, turns out to be wrong uh, in the IPCC report. So uh, again, they're playing the politics. Why did they put in the fact that the Himalayan glaciers are melting, even when the referee said you can't do that because there's no scientific evidence for it, and it's almost certainly wrong? The author said he did it because he knew it would grab the public imagination. Likewise for the dying polar bears. I mean, no, no polar bears died because of receding ice. They might in the future, however. So let's put in that they're dying now. It, 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 it's, you've got to be careful what you read. You know the IPCC report is not a scientific paper. And yet you tend to forget that when you quote it, because it looks like a scientific paper. It is not seriously refereed. Here's another reason why people in the United States, particularly Republicans, are suspicious about global warming. There hasn't been any in 14 years. These are the records of the three other groups. I haven't put ours up here yet. We're, we're, we're just filling in from this region right now. But uh, there's been no, no warming over 14 years. Uh, this could simply be a statistical fluctuation. Or it could be the fact that the sunspots have actually gone down a bit in an anomalous way. When they come back up, we'll get global warming you know, raging. Or it could be that the Gulf Stream fluctuations are changing in a way that we're now going to have a decade or two without global warming, followed by enormous global warming in 20 years. I'll show you the data for that in a moment. OK, so that's our logo. Um, I, I, I talked about these things. There are several other things I didn't talk about. Uh, the other groups adjust the data for instrument change. And in the process of adjusting it, they add a, a warming signal. Now, that's fine to do if you're doing it right. And it's required. And you have to do it. And, but we, we, if they do it in a way that's not reproducible, we redid that. This is the urban heat island effect. This is the warming curve I showed you previously. This is Tokyo. Tokyo has warmed enormously more. Why? Because they're mostly because they're burning more energy in Tokyo and building things that absorb more sunlight. But you don't want that to, to, to affect your data. Uh, this is the yearly average from our data. So here you can see the, the, the fluctuations that take place. And I was particularly interested in these fluctuations because it turns out that those fluctuations are the same basically all around the world. They are real. You take different data sets and analyze them, and you get the same fluctuations. Most people call them, uh, when I ask, they say, oh, that's El Nino. And so I got a plot of El Nino, and I correlated it with that, and I looked at, looked at that, and, uh, and there was, there was pretty, a pretty good agreement. But there are other things, too. There's the Gulf Stream oscillations, called the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillations. These are very interesting. I'm going to come back to this several times. But it also has fluctuations up and down. This, this, these fluctuations are believed by many people to come about because of the great conveyor belt that flows up, up, up the Gulf Stream, then goes down, returns, goes all the way around the world. But the turning over point is in the North Atlantic. And variability in that can cause variability in climate. Anyway, when I did the correlation, what I found was, I'm, I'm running short on time, so I'm going to go through this quickly. I'm going to come back to you, you know, individually or the questions afterwards. Uh, here, what I've done is detrended. So these are the temperature measurements. You can see them bouncing around. You can see the three different, four different groups have pretty much agreement in the ups and downs. And what do these ups and downs do? This is El Nino. And you can see this actually a fairly good match for some of them. There's the 1998 peak. And there are a few other peaks. There are the places where they don't match so well. But it's not bad. But when you compare it to the North Atlantic, to the Gulf Stream, you get a match that is significantly better. And this is a new discovery, that the Gulf Stream, the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation, the AMO, is more important than El Nino in that uh, decadal variation. And this paper has been accepted for publication in the uh, Journal of Geophysical Research. Uh, so I hope it will appear soon. But it's on our website. They allow us to publish, put them on the website. So you can, you, you can read it there. But this, is, this came as a big surprise. It's amazing to me that this had been missed. I think the reason we were able to do it, and nobody else did, is because we have all that data conveniently available on my laptop. And I could just ask questions and type some things in and, and, and get the answers. So now we believe that those are mostly the Gulf Stream oscillations. OK, back to this. So one thing we noticed is the coldest point on record was in 1815, which is when a huge volcano went off. And they called it the, the year without a summer. And so I was going to show this at a meeting. And then I realized, wait a minute. 
Looks like it was heading down ahead of time. How did it know the volcano was going to go off? <laughs> but then I realized this is a 10-year running average. And so if you have a 10-year running average, you know, 10 years ahead of time, you're going to be lower because of that point. So let's look at the one-year average. And here's the one-year average. And you can see, here's Tambora right here. Well, what is this? The coldest year on record was six years before Tambora. Again, what's going on here? Volcanoes are not really causing the cold year on record. There's something else doing it. So basically, I gave this presentation at, uh, at, at a climate meeting. And, and the climate model is really upset because this seems to indicate there's something other than volcanoes that can cause <coughs> these things. And they had always thought this cold period was due to the volcano, but now it anticipates it six years. The really coldest year was six years before that. So that night, Robert Rohde, the guy I mentioned to you on our team, had some vague memory of something. He spent the night online <laughs> looking things up. And what he discovered was this paper about a cold decade and how there was a, an, another stratospheric volcanic eruption almost as big as Tambora that took place basically six years earlier. There it is. Uh, th here's Tambora. And then here's that precursor volcanic eruption, which was not observed widely, but was really there. And corresponds exactly to when this took place. So now we know the two largest volcanic eruptions of the last, really, 200 years took place here and here, stratospheric. And there they were exactly where we saw the coldest. So the next day at the conference, they gave me five minutes to say, <laughs> we have some new results. And we had found this paper. And it's the only paper, nobody in the conference knew about this other volcano. Because, you know, what's, what's the big interest in another volcano? Uh, anyway, uh, that, was, that was kind of a, 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 a cute thing. Now, what about these variations here? What are they? Well, we don't know what they are. We didn't know what they were. But at the conference, uh, another scientist uh, showed me data he had that he had obtained not from thermometers, but from the Greenland ice. He had measured oxygen isotopes, that's a proxy for temperature, in the Greenland ice. He believed he saw variations that he attributed to the Gulf Stream, the AMO. And this is what he showed me. And here they are. This is what he had previously, he actually hadn't published these. He had done a spectrum of these and published that. But the match to our cycles was remarkably good. Again, the Gulf Stream coming in. And this may be a variability in the thermal haline circulation. And we all have to pray it is. We'll see why in a moment. OK. So oh, there, there, that's a better point. OK. So uh, what can we do? Rise in carbon dioxide and that thing there. Uh, roughly, you do a simple calculation and say, that, how much warming should that carbon dioxide create? And there's some uncertainty. It's a factor of two uncertainty. And you, within a factor of two, that much warming. And, and, and that's the reason for concern. Not because elaborate computer models verify this, or because we really know that this is human cause with a 90% confidence level. You know how the IPCC determined their 90% confidence level? I learned this recently. I thought they'd done it by making plots and doing error analysis and calculating confidence levels. But no, they did by vote. <laughs> they had a vote. There are some people who wanted 62% confidence level, and other people wanted 95%, but the winner and the compromise was for 90%. See, it's not really a scientific paper. Well, you read 90% confidence level, and you might mistakenly think it is. So now we come to the really bad news. And this, this is a plot that I actually published in the Wall Street Journal. And this was back uh, the week of the Copenhagen uh, meeting is when I published it. Because at that time, on the table, there was a possible uh, treaty that President Obama refused to sign, even though he was there. And his reason was that the Chinese wouldn't allow inspections. That was his reason for not signing. And then there were Republicans, that, that the Chinese would not allow inspections. But this is the plot that came out that same week. And what it shows is what the agreement would have led to. Because this is the United States here cutting its emissions by 80% by 2050. So these are emissions of the United States. These are the emissions of China and the emerging countries cutting their emission intensity by 4% per year. Now, many people, including uh, NewsHour and other 
really neutral news organizations didn't even realize that when they said they're cutting the emission intensity, what they meant is that they, even though their economy is growing at 10% per year, their emissions will only grow at 6%. So this assumes that the treaty was signed and abided by, and then this is the future. And as you can see, most of the carbon dioxide from the future is coming from the developing world, not from the US, not from Europe, not, from, not even from Sweden. That's very sobering. And what does the Department of Energy of the US say about this? They say, oh, we don't expect that economy to keep on growing. It's going to go something like this. But if that's the case, we don't, we're not going to have much global warming. I mean, every, every year they announced global warming is more than we had projected. The reason was that China last year, during the recession, grew but only 9% per year. But their projections had them growing at 3%. So here is the really bad news. Assume the model was right. Now, I'm not sure the model was right. And I have some issues with it, and we can discuss that. But assume the model was right, just for the sake of argument. And then ask, what can the United States do to stop global warming? And the answer is, we can do this. Now, if we do that, and it really stimulates our economy, so it, it becomes really valuable to do that, then China will follow our lead. But China's a poor country. And if we do this by spending lots of money, now, by the way, I'm drifting away from physics, not my area of expertise. I probably sound like an amateur, but, but at least I understand these projections which some of the economists might not. Uh, if, if, if they can't afford to follow our lead, then setting an example, and setting an example where we do it by either hurting the economy or spending lots of money is something that I believe they can't afford to follow. And every political scientist I know says that if their growth rate drops below 7%, their government's going to be unstable. And they believe that. That's what they believe. So last year, 9%. But they have average 10% per year growth over the past 20 years. That's their average growth. It's not a bubble, because they're just playing catch-up. And somewhere around here, 2032, they will be producing more carbon per person than the United States. So I ask you, if you have a solution, I want to hear what it is. I, at this point, suspect, one, that global warming is real, Two, that it's caused by humans. And three, that I don't see any solution for slowing it down. And simply calling the United States the bad guy, because we're responsible for most, well, actually, you know, the US is responsible for about 20% of the global warming so far. That means 0.2 degrees Celsius. That's what the US is responsible for. That, that, there's no damage around the world due to global warming. There's no flooding that's taking place due to global warming or hurricanes. That, that's all in the future. That's the things that I worry about for the future. But it hasn't happened yet. The warming hasn't been enough. But I expect it to be enough. And so I expect bad things to happen. So we have to stop it. But what can we do? And I, I, I really am looking for a good solution to that. So let me wind up. Now, oh, that's the U.S. contribution. Yeah. Uh, here's our cause for hope. This is the North Atlantic fluctuations. These variations are due to, uh, we hope, we think, due to variability in the, in the thermal haline circulation. What about this rise? Currently, the climate scientists say this rise is caused by humans. This variation is natural. And now this part is humans. <laughs> Let's assume for a moment that this is actually caused by a natural variability. If that's the case, then much of the warming we have seen in the last 30 years is this. Look at the number of degrees. And we're talking here about a rise of about 0.5 degrees Celsius. So much of the warming is due to a natural cause. That means the amount due to humans is less. And that gives us some hope that we can really do something about it, particularly invoking long-term solutions. And in a whole other talk, I, I just finished writing the book, Energy for Future Presidents. And in that book, I really make the case that I, I, I think is persuasive that we really have to go full bore with energy conservation, with energy efficiency, with solar, with wind, and with the obvious third part of that triumvirate, nuclear. I, I, I make that case. And, and Fukushima, uh, total deaths from Fukushima are going to be less than 100. 
I mean, you may not have heard that number, and I don't know why you haven't heard that number, but, but uh, I'm, I'm sure hoping that this is the case. And it's one of the things we're going to be doing this coming year, is really looking at, this is the thermohaline circulation. I'm going to wind up with a movie. Uh, this is a movie that we made based on our 39,000 sites, going back to 1800. Let me just click on it and get it going. And start. Thank you. And uh, in, the, in 1804, we didn't have much coverage. So we only show where it is. But this is the average. You can see it was quite cool in the area we had. This is also the average here. You can see it was quite cool. So the bouncing red dot, every now and then it gets warm, and then it gets cool, and then it gets warm, and then it gets cool, and then it gets warm, and so on. And you can see that up here. You might, want, you might be more interested in Sweden, or if you're me, it may be Berkeley. But, but you can see how things change. The sort of things you'll notice are the huge variability, how things pulse and come and go and leave. You see really hot point. Certain times here, when the temperature in Sweden was up here at the top, and then it drops down. You really have to be careful. If you have uh, 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 several dozen uh, French women dying because of the heat spell, uh, don't confuse that with global warming. Look how it pulses. And then look at the hot spot there, and then there, and then it goes back and forth, goes around. This pattern is complex. And what we're interested in is the average. You notice here we are in 1892. We have pretty good world coverage. Don't have Antarctica yet, just a little bit here. And the temperature is going up. We're coming out of the little ice age. Uh, the last rise in the last 30 years will be most impressive. In 1933, we have a thing that's famous in the United States called the Dust Bowl. And, and uh, I, I, I was always looking for that. Here we come. You can watch it in 1933. Get ready. Uh, 33! Woo! That is historically enormously important in the United States. It happened during the Depression, caused a huge amount of migration, was very disruptive. Steinbeck wrote this great book, Grapes of Wrath, all about it. And you saw it there as a two to three year pulse. Well, these things are happening all the time. Now we have Antarctica. Uh, as we get up to 19, uh, look up uh, at, at 1998, uh, you'll see we're, getting, we're beginning to rise now. We've picked a color scheme to make it look even worse. Uh, and you'll, you'll see as we get to 1998 how the world gets much redder. But it is bouncing. There are cool, cool things here. And uh, 1998, there it's everything's very red. The, the data here stops at 2009. Pretty soon, we'll have, this this movie is available online. By the way, look at the look at Russia here. <coughs> Remember those economists who said you're ignoring uh, the, uh, Siberia? Well, they were right. It was really cold in Siberia uh, when they made that complaint. Uh, and in fact, it had been cooled compared to the average. So, uh, but when you see the pulsing here, you see why it wound up making no difference. Because it was just a pulse of cold. So th th that's the end. And I'll be happy, and so this is what we're going to do next. These are, these are more things. Really odd for a guy who got his PhD in particle physics, moved into astrophysics, started a cosmic microwave program, started a supernova program, then went into geophysics, uh, came up with issues about what killed the dinosaurs. Uh, geomagnetic reversals, and now of all things I never would have predicted I would be working so hard on trying to understand the climate. But it's been, been fascinating and, and contentious uh, and, and, a, and a, an amazing experience. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rich, for this very exciting talk. Please room for some questions. How do you measure this uh, oscillations, A-M-O? What is what is actually did you what did you show? What we oh, you mean how 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 do how do we actually combine thirty nine thousand stations? No no, how do you measure these Atlantic oscillations? What what oh, did you show? Uh, historically, it was discovered only a few decades ago, uh, and it, what, you can drop down deep sea thermometer measurements. What you what was found was that you know what happens to the Gulf Stream, the water flowing up, it dips down. Uh, and then comes back, and you can actually see this flow on the bottom of the Atlantic. It's moving quite slowly, but it's, it's a huge amount of water. They measured it in spherdrums, which is cubic kilometers of water. Um, and and, and that is the, the, it's been mapped out now pretty much around the world. You can measure the velocity, and you can measure the temperatures. So this is it's like plate tectonics, which nobody knew about. And then suddenly it revolutionized, uh, revolutionized uh, geophysics. Uh, the thermal haline circulation now is in that process of revolutionizing our understanding of the oceans. Uh, the variability is measured primarily by 
averaging the temperature of the North Atlantic, uh, and, and that's why I showed the North Atlantic. Does that answer your question? Not quite, because you I think you showed the data from 18, from 1800. Right. And you found some correlations with temperature that's oscillation. Right. But was this we, at that point there were temperatures being measured in uh, in Europe, and we're, all I showed you were the land temperatures. Uh, there were the measurements made in the Greenland ice that correlated with our land measurements. Those temperatures in the Greenland ice had been attributed previously to the North Atlantic variability. That may not be right. It may be that they're, all they're seeing is the same thing that we're seeing. But the fact that in oxygen 18 measurements in Greenland ice, they're seeing the same 24-year period that we see in, in, in the thermometers so, uh, is, is a vindication that what we're seeing is, is real, as, as we thought it was, because it was within our 95% confidence limits. We have a question. Uh, I have a question. I'm afraid I have a pretty much large box of questions. <laughs> <laughs> you get one. No. Pick your best. But, we'll come back um, to you. About the stations, I have some uh, concerns because uh, uh, how they are distributed in Europe, how they are they've been distributed in the time that you took uh, the measurements, plus uh, it's been the environment around this station, uh, stations changed in this 100 years or 200 years. Well, let me answer that. The way we handled that was uh, there are now satellite measurements that cover the entire Earth. And the MODIS satellite has classified uh, every region of the Earth, every square half kilometer, uh, into something like 13 different, maybe 19 different categories. What we did is we chose areas that currently are rural and distant from any current urban site. We call these the very rural stations. It's possible that they used to be cities and are now rural, but for the most part, that's not going to be the case. If it's rural now, it's always been rural. And what we've done is we then calculate the temperature of the Earth based solely on these very rural stations. Now, I think I can actually show you something here if I can find it. Uh, uh, and then we compare that temperature measurement to what we get when we, uh, to the one we get when we include everything. Uh, and the, the result basically, uh, I have a really nice plot here. Oh, here it is. So this is the difference between, the blue line is the difference between the uh, very rural sites, the ones that are far from any currently urban site, and what we got when we just included the entire world. When we do the world, we don't weight the stations. What we do is we take every square kilometer of the Earth and calculate its best temperature based on the nearby stations and on our measured correlations. And so we, we calculate the, and we take into account the, the correlations between stations to do this in an optimum way. So we're actually averaging not over stations, we're averaging over the square kilometers of the Earth. But when we just do the same thing using just the very rural sites and subtract the two, these are the error uncertainties in red, but you'll see the difference, there's no difference whatsoever indicating that, that, that the uh, urban effects are not, and it's not too surprising actually, because the urban effects like Tokyo are huge, but the area of the Earth that, that is urban today is, is less than about half a percent. But it really shouldn't contribute too much. And my question was also about the distribution of them in the Earth, because uh, it might be that uh, as the Gulf uh, Stream is affecting more the northern part of the, uh, of the atmosphere, mm -hmm. the southern part is not affected. So what you are actually measuring is biased because you're measuring more in the north, or you have a better distribution of the temperature in the northern part. Well, it turns out two-thirds of the land mass is north of the equator, one-third is less. And so uh, that's the way the world is, and we're only measuring land mass. When, when we put in the oceans in the coming year, we will have a uniformly covered Earth. But right now, we're only measuring the land mass. And yes, that's biased to the northern hemisphere, because that's where the land is. No, I'm talking about the distribution of the of the, of the stations, not about the... Well, you, you saw in the map that we have really, a, certainly for the last 60 years, which is when the global warming, according to the IPCC, becomes evident. In those last 60 years, we have excellent coverage of the entire world. And we do not, we weight the world equally. Every square kilometer of, of Patagonia counts just as much as a square kilometer of, 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 of Tokyo. Or, but do you have enough, uh, enough 
I don't know, Central America, Central US. We don't have as many, but we have enough. What we've done is we've broken the sample up into 10 different parts, 10 totally different sets. We then calculated the temperature for each of those 10 sets, each one of which has one, one tenth of the data. Then we compare those, and that's how we get the error answer. All right, we have time for two more questions. I think Ramon has a question. Could you say something about the, about the time scale here? I mean, about not getting further back in time. I, I realize if you do that, you need to use proxies, but is this something that keeps you up at night, that you don't miss in the full pictures? Well, I, I mean, I wrote a book about proxies. I, I know a lot about that subject, about the ice ages. All the information we have for the ice ages comes from proxies. And they are very good to a certain limit. Uh, but according to the IPCC, the human effect of global warming kicks in around 1958, that's 56, that's what they say. That, that in that modern era is where the human part becomes separate and observable. And so, uh, and from there on, we have really good coverage. So it's that, uh, you know, going back to 1800 is, is wonderful. I'd love to go back further, but I think that the thermometer data is so much better than anything else. Uh, now that we see those same variabilities in the Greenland ice, uh, I, I think uh, that's going to become an, an, an interesting indicator. But that's mostly the northern hemisphere. We don't know whether that's global or not. But I, I think the proxies have limited, limited value. All right, let's see. I think I see two more, two more questions. Let's go ahead. Uh, uh, that, that first picture you showed, uh, which you've shown subsequently as well. Why are there no oscillations after, I don't know, 1960 or thereabouts? Then you just see the trend of global warming. But there are no cycles superimposed. I mean, if yeah, if you analyze it, what you find is that in this region here, there's a 24 year cycle, it seems to be dying out. Yeah. And then right here, there's, a, there's a, a basically a 60 year cycle, uh, which is what everybody had, had noticed previously. The modelers think what's happening here, you know, I don't know if this is true, because you can always explain something. Mm -hmm. But the oceans are not simple oscillators, they're coupled oscillators. And so th th there's mode switching that takes place, and the modelers believe there's some sort of mode switching that turned off this cycle. I, I, for a while, I wondered whether this whole cycle here was triggered by Tambora, mm -hmm. that it was ringing like a bell and then dying down. But uh, I haven't shown this, but we actually have data going back to around 17. Uh, 1750 or so now, mm -hmm. uh, and it has the same cycles in it. So it was not a tambour ringing bell. Uh, we don't know what it is, but it, it, it's unfortunately too easy to explain with most with mode switching. Uh, I mean, it's, the amplitude seems to be increasing backwards as well, but it could be doing that forever, could it? Uh, uh, here, here, w w in the data that I haven't shown here, it actually goes down a little bit. Okay. In fact, I don't think this slope down is significant anymore because. When you get back to here, the data stays up here. It doesn't get that low. So this low thing here probably was Tambor. And that exaggerated the, the, the effect at that time. So uh, what is your attempt at the scientific non-vote confidence level for the, for the uh, human cause global warming? Well, I haven't addressed the global warming, the human part, at all in my scientific work. But you're just asking me for my guess. According to the IPCC, let me quote them, because many people misquote them. Uh, the IPCC says most of the warming of the last 50 years is caused by humans. So you can take that to be 51% to 100%. In other words, the IPCC has a factor of two uncertainty just in their statement. And... Uh, Was that by vote? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, so, so one has to be cautious about saying, that, you know, if you listen to Al Gore, Tom Friedman, they'll tell you all oh, this is due to humans. And, and they are actually skeptics. They should be labeled as skeptics because they're disagreeing with the IPCC. <laughs> um, I, 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 my own guess, and this is simply based on a reading of literature, and I haven't published this, it's a gut feeling that, that they're probably right. It's somewhere between 50% and 100% of what's happened over the last... 50 years, but I'm hoping that 50% of it is due to this variability in the Atlantic. And if that's the case, it's going to go down for a while, which will mislead people into thinking that there's no global warming from humans at all. So you heard it here. You know, I think um, it's not a hard prediction, but I think it's fairly likely. This doesn't show the flattening, but that's because it's a 10-year average. Uh, and and uh, don't be surprised if it starts going down for a few years. That would simply indicate that the Atlantic variability is now kicking in. But the Atlantic variability is, uh, well, the cycle you saw there was 60 years. 
And so in 30 years, it will be at the bottom. And then it will start coming up. And the carbon dioxide is increasing all that time. And then people will worry once again. Because it will be happening at twice the rate now. Because you'll have, you'll have the carbon dioxide already up there. And, 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 the, and the Atlantic Oscillation is shooting up too. So uh, I, I think this is something worth worrying about. But you can't worry about it by throwing money at it. Because China cannot follow that lead. So we have to be more thoughtful in how we do this. All right, so we have one last question now. So um, do you see any trend in time in the statistics of the spatial fluctuations? Well, I, I have, and th this plot doesn't show up. But, but there, in the global plot, the fluctuations seem to be decreasing. Okay, but that's average. You were asking about spatial correlations. And uh, I'm embarrassed to say I have not looked at that yet. But it will be an interesting thing to look at. I'm also interested in whether there's, there's any detectable motion. We know correlations. We've measured all sorts of correlation lengths. But whether those how, the, how, the, how, the, how the patterns change with time, uh, you can download the movie on our website. <laughs> And pretty soon we'll, we'll have a digital version of it that we'll make available, and then you can, you can play with the data yourself. Our goal, by the way, our 39,000 stations and their temperature data are now online. We are very proud of this. Uh, we want to not only analyze this in a better way, but we want to make the data available. Previously, they were available on 15 different websites in 14 different formats, full of bad data, full of overlaps, Basically, nobody could get into that without putting in basically three or four years of effort simply merging the data. We were able to do it in one year, but that's because we have this genius, Robert Grody, who, 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 who is both super smart, super mathematical, and loves handling data. I don't want to say manipulating. So, 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 so we have now put these data online in a text format. And you can download them on our website and start playing with this yourself. And, and what we'd really like to see happen here is this whole field to open up to scientists, in other, not only in the climate field, but to, but to people in every field, and, and start looking at questions like that, answering, not only asking me questions, but recognizing you can now answer the question yourself uh, by going online and getting the data, if you're sufficiently interested. So, so uh, we're, we're really proud. Our program to do the analysis, I didn't describe the, uh, the, the elaborate method we use. We use a statistical method called Kriging. Uh, that, that is, we're, we're, we're proud of adopting that. And the method we use to get this is, is uh, I, I didn't describe that at all, but our 40 page paper on it is available online. All right. and, and, and so is the program. The whole program is available online. You can, if you don't like what we did, change the program, run it yourself. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Rich. Okay.